All right, have fun, y'all. Off mm -hmm. we go. Yo, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, just give everyone a second to come on. All right, from around the world. People from around the world are gathering. Yay. Cool. All right. And so everyone can mute themselves. That would be good. I'll kind of help that. Oh, Ian's here. Hello, Ian. Yay. Cool. Great, great, great. All right, ready to roll, Jeffrey? We are ready. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm gonna put uh, myself in speaker mode here. All right, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to the Bio Dojo uh, Ask the Sensei. Uh, I'm Tish Hicks. I am the Master Sensei of the Bio Dojo here in Burbank, California. And Ask the Sensei is our monthly free Q and A. Um, the first Wednesday of every month, so you can put it in your calendars. Uh, every month, uh, it's me. We are joined by our techno sensei, Dan Leonard, to answer all your technical needs. And we invite one of our esteemed voiceover colleagues um, to join us to answer your questions. And today we are super excited to have Caitlin Robrock here. She is one of the most dedicated and um, Oh gosh, I, I, the, the, the words aren't even coming. Dedicated and um, passionate and um, humble and true animation actors out there. Um, and um, we're really excited to have her here. She, she's um, an extraordinary example of dreams coming true. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, Dan, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and what you are up to, and uh, then Caitlin will will talk a little bit about you. And oh, I forgot. Hold on. Whoa. Hold on. One more. One more housekeeping thing. Um, let me see. Um, if anybody who's here wanna wants to put in the chat where they're from, that's great. Um, I'm gonna put up. Uh, a poll. So um, this is just a poll of where you are in your voiceover journey. And that will allow us to know how to gauge our answers. So we we're not talking, you know, we're, we're talking at a level that everyone's going to be able to get something out of. Um, and then, oh, I'll introduce Dan. Uh, Caitlin will talk a little bit. And then if you want to put your uh, questions in the chat, we'll be um, we'll be um, hold on one second. We'll we'll be um, taking your we'll write your questions in the chat, and then we'll call you up and have you um, have you come and ask them. And if you need anything, uh, Jeffrey Gilbank is our amazing Dojo team member who's here. Uh, making everything run smoothly, so you can ask uh, Jeffrey for help in the in the in the chat if you need anything. So, all right, there is that. Okay, now, Dan, tell us about yeah. what you're up to. <laughs> what am I up to? Well, I'm up to uh, being a full time voice actor and uh, expert on home voiceover studios. We're going to change the name of home voiceover studios. I'm going to try this again. We're going to call them personal professional studios because the idea of uh, we have heard that uh from several clientele around the country and around the world that like i don't want somebody with a home studio uh, ah. has, has uh this connotation of socks hanging on a doorknob behind somebody uh and the fact that a lot of people with home studios don't really know what they're doing my job is to teach you how to do it properly uh, over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. And uh, there's lots of things. There's tremendous amounts of misinformation out there. And my job is to take all that information and uh, erase it from your brain, essentially. Pay <laughs> uh, no attention your, to that misinformation. <laughs> exactly. And learning how to do it properly because everybody's intimidated and they're all like, it's computer stuff. 
and it's not. And uh, if you have any questions on that, throw them in the chat. Uh, anything to do with home voiceover studios or personal professional studio, mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, I will get to those. I love that. And you know what that is also a really, um, really an example of is how we keep on refining what we do in context of what is going on in the world. So you're still doing the same thing then, but you're understanding how to speak of it and how to clearly communicate what is needed um, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that serves what's happening in the world now. So that's, oh, I do have a master's in education, so I, uh, I, didn't, know how to teach I didn't think I didn't think you were any slouch. So just I'm just I'm just commending you on your yeah, that's that's what we all need to keep on doing. So that is brilliant. Yay. And Caitlin, hi. So Hello. excited to have you here. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about you and what you're up to now? And um, love to hear a little, just a, you know, a, a tight version of, of your origin story. Um, uh, and before Caitlin starts that, um, I want to let you know that um, in the coming months, we will be launching uh, something that we call the Odojo 21 Questions, which is an interview uh, that we'll do before um, before this that will be supplemental. So when you get the replay, um, we'll, we'll hear a little an extra in interview with our guests. So Caitlin and I did one and we will be getting it out um, get eventually uh, to share with you. So there's more, we'll talk a little bit here and the, the tight version and then know that there's the extended dance uh, version coming up. The special so, features. The special features, exactly. So Caitlin, I'm gonna stop talking and let you start talking. <laughs> okay. Well, first and foremost, everybody, depending on the architectural structure of your personal professional studio, things might get a little toasty. So please don't mind if I pat myself down just because it's warm in summer. Well, you but can open the door. I mean, it's not like you're doing a remote session here. True, but I foamed that door and it looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like in here, it's a walk-in closet and it's wonderful. And I put this lovely curtain over my clothes. So it's so professional. <laughs> uh, all right, origin story. My dark, seedy origin story. Mine's a little crazy. <laughs> this doesn't happen, so take it with a grain of salt. But about 12 years ago, yeah, 12 years ago, I went to Comic-Con in San Diego. And I go, I go to that every year, not as a guest, but as a con goer. And it's so much fun. And 12 years ago, there was a panel they had uh, on the Drawn Together movie, The Movie, which was a direct-to-DVD feature based off the television show Drawn Together that was on Comedy Central a couple years after the turn of the century. I think it was like 2003 or so. And I knew Jess Harnell, and I wanted to go support him. So we all went, all my friends and I, we went to go see the panel. We were having a good time. And then they made an offer of, we're going to have a contest. And the winner of the contest is going to be drawn into the movie and do a line or two. And immediately I'm thinking, I must have that. <laughs> and so each, like the cast members on the panel, they were like starting to pick people. And I shoot my hand up. And my friends were like, pick a chick, pick someone like her. And they all start pointing at me. And Jess <laughs> sees me, thankfully, and he goes, oh, come up here come on why are you even asking so nepotism does work so we get up there and i'm thinking the contest might be do your favorite impression do your favorite scene something like that and the contest was how long you could stay handcuffed to the creators so they had this pair of fuzzy handcuffs i don't know where they got them and i don't need to know and we were handcuffed me and two others to one of the creators so it's fun publicity we're all laughing. We're walking through the halls like, oh, this is so silly. And we get outside and everyone's like, well, now what do we do? This is a contest. Mm -hmm. And the other two who were handcuffed with me, one of them lived in downtown San Diego. So he said, oh, I'll stay as long as I have to. I live right here. And the other person, he had everything he owned in a backpack. And he was like, oh, I've just been hotel floor hopping among my friends. I'm happy to stay out all night. And I'm thinking I have my home, 
I've got a shower, I've got a bed, I've got food, I've got mm -hmm. wonderful things that I want to mm -hmm. have. How do I escape this situation? But I want to win the contest. And the two other persons, they didn't know there was a voiceover element to it. They thought it was just going to be drawn in. And so Jess had said like, well, let me talk to the creator. Hey, this is Caitlin. I've known her. She's working to be a voice actor. She's got the talent and enough professionalism to do what the job is that we're offering. Let's just give it to her and then we can draw everybody in the movie. And so everyone wins. So that's what they decided to do. So we all got to go home. And then I started, we did a couple voices. It's uncredited, but we did a couple voices in the movie. I'm Smurfette. I'm the, the hot bar chick. I'm the second old lady. <laughs> that was so long ago. Mm. And that was my first ever voiceover gig. Mm -hmm. And the creators, they brought me in for their other show to read for that. And we got to the callbacks and it was me and Jennifer Tilly. So I think you know who they went with. But the people <laughs> who were a part of that callback, uh, higher ups at Adult Swim, they liked what they heard enough where they said, okay, we're going to send you over to these people. They're doing another pilot. And it's this show called Mr. Pickles. It's about this demonic dog and, a, and his naive mm -hmm. little boy and their family in this crazy town. So I went in for that and read for the mom and the girlfriend. And then right before I left, they said, by chance, can you do a little boy voice? And I said like, well, I've got one that I can do and it's really young and scrappy and he thinks he's the best. And that's how I booked that role. So they decided, oh, we're gonna go with that precocious, innocent child in this world of sin. And then the mom went to Brooke Shields and I got the girlfriend and she was killed off in the first episode, so. <laughs> so my first death, and we've we've done that show its entire run and then it switched over to mama named me sheriff same show different perspective and focus of the characters but it's still it was still going up to this year mm -hmm. so who knows what the future holds in store the pandemic did change a lot of things but that mm -hmm. was my first ever like big breakthrough with adult swim i did my animation demo with bill farmer when he created his demo production house and mm -hmm. he Blessedly, Who is the voice of Goofy? Yes, the voice of Goofy. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he blessedly took my demo, took my show that I had, and presented me to his agent, Sandy Schnarr and Peter Verano at AVO Talent. And mm -hmm. it, it took a lot of faith on his part to just recommend someone out of the blue. And I've got this trick voice, this little kid voice that I've done for years, and it serves the purpose, but you have to make sure like you're growing your range, you're growing your acting. So AVO was very kind to take me on so early in my career mm -hmm. and I listen back to some of those all the old auditions and I think like they really took a chance on me <laughs> now, ooh, you, everyone starts somewhere every every time you work you're always at your best at that moment so then the more and more you grow when you look back at what was my best in 2013 that's why I didn't book anything so it's mm -hmm. all part of that process and and my agents they helped cultivate it they helped me grow and I, I took so many workshops and clinics. I still do. It's always mm -hmm. constant upkeep. Mm -hmm. And just slowly over time, but surely, you know, work begets work. You book a little here, you book a little there. Casting directors and, and producers know, start to know your name. They start to know your reputation, your work ethic, who's your agent. And doing the workshops and classes helps to give them a visual. This mm -hmm. is who this person is. This is how directable they are right here in the moment. Is this something that, you know, we could use in the future? And workshops and classes never guarantee work, but it, it doesn't hurt to show them this is who I am. So they'll remember that in the future if like a role comes along and they think, hey, you know, this person did this role eight months ago in my class. Let's have her audition for it. Let, let's put a note on her. Mm -hmm. So and that's and just kind of the big journey so far. Um, and can you talk about the other big part of your journey? And, oh, and yes. I know, I know you, you are Fight Club regular or you, know, you come to Fight Club when mm -hmm. you can. And um, you met someone there that, that built, yes. started building a relationship. So can, can, you share, can you share that part? I can, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Just checking with Dan. Everything sounding good, Dan? Did I get it? Yeah, all right. <laughs> even more, even more. There you go. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, down, down, oh, down. This is part of the process, kids. There you go. There you go. There we go. All right. No touchy. 
Um, <laughs> and it's a perfect example of, of what we're talking about. I had done um, one of my VO Dojo workshops with a casting director who's a part of the Disney company. And we did some voice matching where they see what's your voice type like, what's a similar character, how close can you match the character, how can we direct you. And they give, they give that information to you before the class. So always make time to do practice and rehearsal. The more practice you do, the better it gets. So we went in for this class. We performed that particular character. And my favorite part was it was a high, it was an upper voiced character for a, a different Disney franchise. And she said, you know what? I can't believe I'm saying this, but lower your voice. The voice actress <laughs> you're matching isn't that high. So it, <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. And this person remembered me later down the line when I was auditioning for Disney for other things, wink, and it really helped out because she knew, hey, this person has a good ear for voice matching. She did her homework in the class. Um, I know she's someone who's going to put her best foot forward if this is a character she ends up booking with us. Mm -hmm. And I also, it also helped a lot that I worked at Disneyland at the time. So working at Disneyland, it's another branch of the Disney company. It's the same character integrity. It's keeping that magic for all of our audience members. It's making sure that it's a blessing and a very humbling experience to be a voice of a character that reaches so many people. But for our little ones, it's real to them. And I've seen it firsthand when little ones would come up to meet characters at the park. That's the real one. They may not be talking to me right now, but I'm hugging them. I'm getting a picture. I'm holding their hands. It's that visceral connection that they can get and not just with that slight distance of a TV. So knowing that importance for the characters really makes it that much more of a joy to be a steward of this character. Mm -hmm. And and just just so we're not, it seems like what are you talking about? Um, can you say can you say who you who you're the yes. voice of? Or, okay. Yes. Um, that's another part of, especially with Disney, you want to have a light touch with things. We want the character to speak for herself and mm -hmm. make it about her. I'm just the person who's holding that stewardship. So I'm very, very honored to be the current voice of Minnie Mouse at this time. And it's been an absolute joy. The the highlight of my entire career. If if your career is a crown, this is the the jewel in the centerpiece. <laughs> So and she has just, been it's just on track. So Matt, it's it's not even over. So <laughs> no. And uh, these types of jobs, you hold them until you can't anymore, be it health related or at everyone's due passing, you know, for how we you know not to jinx anything. But or, or sometimes people for other characters have said, like, you know, I've loved the time I've done, but I'm starting to wind down. Let's look for the next steward to help carry on a character. Yeah. So, and th that's nice because there's that time for overlap. There's time for mentorship. There's time to really make sure it's transitioning and keeping that same magic the character has. And yeah. I had been practicing my mini voice for years, years and years and years, because I was very lucky to have an upper register that was so similar mm -hmm. to Rusi Taylor's. Mm -hmm. And working at Disneyland, I hear the parades, I hear the stage shows, I hear the fireworks. So you hear it enough times and you you mimic it back, it's more and more easier, especially on your throat. So when when this audition came around, I knew I'm at the best I can possibly be. It's it's now or never. Yeah. Well, there's so there's so many layers, and and uh, if people want to start putting their questions in, there's so many layers in what you just shared, Caitlin. Because um, the you know the first thing is that you love this, you love oh, yeah. it. You're a fangirl at a convention. The second thing is you've been hanging out with top-notch people. Jess Harnell is, is an animation legend, and um, so and also one of the most passionate people in the business. And so you know you figured out how how did you know whatever way. You became friends with Jess Harnell. You know, one of the things we say about our, our Fight Club is um, the tagline for Fight Club, our working pro workout is, yeah, it's who you know. But not like, yeah, it's who you know. It's like, no, get to be friends with people who are doing the things that you mm -hmm. want to do. So that that's the other thing I, I heard, being clear about what you, you being prepared for every opportunity and 
you being ready to spend the night on the stage if you needed to. And I know you were talking to earlier, you talk about like how you'd be at, be at Disneyland all day and then drive up to do a workshop. Oh, yes. You went the extra mile, literally, always, <laughs> right? Um, and then the other thing that I just want to reflect back to you, Caitlin, is you you immerse you immerse yourself in the in the culture of what your dream was, right? Mm-hmm. Like you you live and breathe and literally work um, in that realm and understand the ins and outs and know all the all the requirements of it. Um, and then you also kind of embody, you know, the character's heart you know, um, that that she, she is, she is kind and she is helpful and she is, you know, makes things sparkle. And I don't know, it it just seems like you really embody it. And that humility, that humility that you bring to um, this, you know, in some ways, this is like, I mean, Super Bowl of VO, right? To get an iconic character that is like tenured, right? (laughs) For yes for the rest of your, as long as you would like, and, you know, don't get into any scandals or anything like that. Right? I'm very low key. Like yeah. the biggest scandal is like, I didn't get mail for three days and it piled oh, up. Like, the so yeah. There's not much. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty big homebody. So the pandemic <laughs> didn't change too much in my like day to day since yeah. I am home a lot, but that's an excellent point you had made, like the growth of the career. It's different for everybody. And this might answer some other questions uh, Mm -hmm. if anyone had a similar type, but it's different for everybody. And you never exactly know what someone is doing behind the scenes to practice and work. Some people come at it where they're very low key. They work really hard. They take lots of classes, they practice, and then they book something big. And it seems like they came out of nowhere. They're, you know, they just got it right away. That's so incredible. It's what a savant, but you never know. They may have been working on this for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And for myself, it took a long time. And I would say longer than average because of the constraints I had. So Mm. I knew I wanted to do voiceover when I saw Aladdin and Robin Mm -hmm. Williams. And the year before I had seen Hook and I knew I wanted to be an actor in general because of Robin Williams. But back then I thought you have to be on Broadway all of these big Disney animated people are yeah. singers. And so yeah. I had worked yeah. towards stage theater because that's the strongest acting, in my opinion, that could influence your voice over acting. You have stage yeah. acting, you're performing for a, a wide house live, it's in person, they got to see everything. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just different than TV and film. And mm-hmm. not to say that TV and film isn't also acting. Plenty right. of celebrities in that world do wonderful at VO. Yeah, we're having a little glitchy thing. The other thing that I want to reflect back is that you also talked about being right there in the mix with the celebrities who might have gotten the job. But I think that's another myth that people go like, oh, well, it's all going to celebrities. Like, yeah, and not, right? And it can go mm-hmm. to you too. Yeah. yeah, this is so good. Um, let's let's uh, open up to some questions. You guys ready for some questions? And I have a tech question of, of animation, but I'll, I'll let's get some other folks up. Um, let's see. I think Jeffrey might have. Yep. Uh, I have, we have some questions lining up. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I, wasn't, so, I couldn't see you for a second. So. <laughs> oh, in the chat. Let's see. Yes. So, um, I'll call on, I'll call on people and I'll, uh, ask you to mute yourself so you can ask your questions, uh, over your devices. So, uh, first up we have Phyllis Fort, uh, and then here we go. Yeah. There. Um, is it still true it's best to be in California to do animation? You know, up until the pandemic, I would have said yes, but there's so much change that's happened. Mm-hmm. And so many of my peers have moved away from California to different states and they have their professional studios built in their new homes. And they're still able to work because that's how we've had to work this last year. So I could easily see it happening beyond this year. I believe it's best to go in the studio because it ensures you're getting the exact quality the engineer likes. It's less work for the engineer to clean up any 
issues that might be in my recording space. And the, my old place I lived in, there were a couple. And so I always thanked my engineers profusely because they had to deal with a little bit more issues with that. And then in here, it's been way, way better. But I would say like being in California for me is the best thing because uh, I've been working enough animation where I'm going to several studios. My family lives here and family is very important to me. Mm-hmm. So uh, even if it's cheaper to move elsewhere or there's no reason not to go wherever you want, I want to be where my family is. Mm-hmm. And I, I make it work. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're in a place where you can't move to California, you could definitely sh- have the best possible professional studio you've got at your disposal. You can reach out to L.A. agents or New York agents, showing them this is who I am, this is what I've got, this is my recording capability. And that shouldn't deter you from being able to work more. And I, I think I think a lot of a lot of the um, you know a lot of the case for um, for doing things here is um, uh, being available. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you did have to come to the studio, being available and having your schedule adjustable so you could be here. And then I think it's a lot of just relationship. So now that the nature of that has changed, then the you know the 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 journey is still like how do you how do you get to know people and get people to know you, and then it's becoming less important where you are. Yeah, but you know that's all that's all transitioning. And um, I I. Some places even offered like temporary microphones and rigs to our actors during the pandemic. And I didn't need one for myself. My setup was good. But I would say like if you wanted to live where you want to live and be able to work more in animation, it it is building those relationships and it's making sure your studio is the best possible to be compatible with these other professional studios in L.A. Save up that money for that U87. That's what I'm doing because I know that that's a good microphone I use a lot in my studio. I've got a Rode NT1 that I've gotten checks across the board for the quality, but if I want to if I wanted to work more from home, I would make that investment for a stronger microphone. Well, mm. you know, can I make a comment? Yes, please. D- yeah. Dan knows more about this than I. <laughs> Will a U87 change the way you perform or improve your talent at all? Well, does it have anything to do with how you perform copy? No, it does not. Then I would say then save your money and uh, because U87, if you think that it sounds great now, a U87 will make you sound great, but will also make the rest of your house sound fabulous. <laughs> so that's, you know, an NT1, you know, the, the road mics are very, very quiet mics. It works great. If nobody's complaining, there's no reason if you want to say, well, I have this for the status of having it. I think that's sort of a, a misplaced uh, priority uh, because the mic you're using is getting you work, and and I and clearly it's not a reason you're not getting work. And a U87 is not going to increase your value. It's not going to increase your your capability. It's something. It's it's. I, I guess it's a psychological thing, but a U87 is. I think people need to understand. And I, this, I think, is one of those pieces of in, misinformation that keeps getting tossed out there. All of this stuff, all of, all of these devices that we use were never designed for, for recording voiceover. They were all designed for making music or for electronic news gathering or, in the last three years, uh, podcasting. Um, uh, and the fact of the matter is, there's just nobody sitting in a boardroom somewhere saying, you know, we need to make a, a voiceover microphone for our company. And it, it, it doesn't happen. The U87 is designed for very, very specific purposes in very, very specific places. And your closet in your home may not be the ideal environment for an expensive microphone like that. Is, as I like to say, if you're going to buy a Ferrari, you better have a nice garage for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the U87 is not going to capture you any differently than anybody else, than any other microphone that's you know comparable or in the same price range. And I, I think there's sort of this, oh, get a U87, that's going to make me a better voice actor. I find that to be not true at all. And there isn't an engineer out there that could say, oh, you're on a U87. You know, because K 
Caitlin is different from Thomas and, and, and everybody else. Every voice is different. Every room is different. And there's no engineers out there. And I've spoken to a lot of engineers. They say, yeah, well, we use this in our studio. They cost, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, which I'm sure your, your closet does not cost. No. And <laughs> <laughs> this was... <laughs> This is a but. This is like a fifty surplus of insulation foam I got off Amazon. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and a and a structure I bought third hand from Debbie Dairyberry, but it's it has oh, served have, me well thing, for two yeah. years. And yeah, I've never I've never heard anything from my engineers about change this, change that. Yeah. Nothing you're doing if there's a problem is not fixable on our end, not unfixable on our end. Right, and, that, and that. if it's not broke, don't don't fix, fix it. You know, so, uh, you know, if you want to have a U87, just remember, nobody needs to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> That's great. And I love, I love <laughs> in how, how you just surround yourself with like animation mojo, right? Because like you've got Debbie's, Debbie's energy in, in your, in it's the, it's infused in the, in the yeah, foam. It's great. And you're you carrying press it and here. the sweat comes off. And <laughs> little boy voices That's come out. That's Debbie yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, let's let's keep on. Um, mm -hmm. Let's keep on going with questions. So uh, I hope that you. answered your question, Janice. Um, and if there's studios it's around where you yeah. live as well, that's always worth checking out. And th there's mm -hmm. lots of options before you would have to pick up shop and move out here. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, let's talk to Laura. Laura's. Uh, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow where Laura is, unless she's she's on in the future. Before. She's in the future. Um, can that we get I Laura? am. Yeah. Hey, good to see you. Hi. Yeah. Um, my question. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Laura. Hi. Um, She's in Australia. You... That's why we were saying yes. that weird stuff. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's 3 a.m. <laughs> oh my. Um. Yeah. Um. Have you ever felt pressure to like mimic exactly, well, not exactly, but mimic what like Rosie Taylor and other Minnie Mouse voice actors have? Um done or do you have a little bit of freedom to kind of make mini your own and like um, while still paying homage to the original mm -hmm. character and voice both i i am my own worst critic and i'm very hard on myself especially because it's something i love so much and when we get angry or frustrated or very tunnel vision about something it's because we care about it and we love it and we want to continue giving the warmth and kindness and love to this character that our predecessors did because we loved them doing it. And I, I'm always pressuring myself to make sure, like, you got to make sure you're sounding your vowels right. Are you scooping over on certain words? Are you scooping under? When you say Mickey, are you having it slightly nasal because it's Mickey? She's so in love, just it breathes out of her. <laughs> and in the beginning, the, the pitch... I had no problem, but because I had so much focus on like my diaphragm, it was almost too shrill, almost, not not quite, mm. but just enough where like, no, 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 she is that high, but there's a whisper crawl, uh, breathy quality in there. Uh, she lets it roll around in her head. It's not here in the chest or the diaphragm. And that was a learning process. And I was already so close at that point. It's like, let's get the nuance. Let's 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 make sure it slides correctly when you do a line read we do three takes of a line i change up the way i say it each time i try to change the point of view of my acting and and i always encourage anyone who hears it like do you want it read a certain way is that hitting the ballpark um if i hear little cracks or creaks i'll redo it because i'll hear that here but like someone over zoom they may not hear that and sometimes if i do the really high stuff zoom won't catch it it's too high for zoom's quality wow i know <laughs> but the more and more i've done it the more little bits of me have kind of come in and my favorite example is there was one episode of mixed up adventures where daisy thinks her grandmother is this superhero and her grandmother had sent her a note like go to my house and, and get the special gift for you it, it's time you knew and the it was time Daisy knew that her grandmother was part of a cosplay group of superheroes. But Daisy <laughs> thought she was the real superhero. Like I knew these comic books were real. These are these are autobiographies. These aren't fiction. And she goes there and she's explaining to Minnie and Cuckoo Loca, this is the character. These are the these are their superpowers. And you guys, you're gonna be my sidekicks and help me. 
And the most traditional way of Minnie's response of how do we do that, I would think is, well, how do we do that? You know, we're, we're interested to know, aren't you kids? And I just ended up doing, how do we do that? It was so kind of just off the cuff of like, oh, Daisy, how do we do that? Please, t- <laughs> please tell me. And it was just this wry delivery that is 100% me. Like, I don't think Minnie would say it, but it was such a funny moment. We just, we took that and ran with it. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's little bits here and there that are coming through that I do specifically. If if she and her friends are getting in a wacky situation and they fall off a cliff and they're screaming all the way down, halfway through, I start laughing because actually this is fun. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Ah! Mm-hmm. So that was a little something as well. So little bits and pieces here. But mm-hmm. I always try to think, what would Rusi do? How would Minnie sound like this? Watching the old cartoons that Marcelite Garner did and Ruth Clifford did, like those have so many gems as well because they were the first minis after Walt. Mm -hmm. And just you want to draw little bits from each one. Well, and I think that if I'm going to serve this character and those who came before me, I want to make sure I'm learning my history. Mm hmm. Yeah, with, so with, with iconic, it's so cool, Caitlin. With iconic, with iconic characters comes great responsibility. It's just mm-hmm. everything that you share is like, yep, yeah. Well, let's let's keep on going so we can get um, more voices, more questions, and voices in the room. Uh, Diana. Uh, and also, uh, if in the interest of getting as many questions in as possible, oh. um, Diana and uh, Shara, I think, have mm-hmm. kind of similar questions that play off mm-hmm. of technique. So uh, I'd like to invite Diana to ask her question first, and then I'll invite Char to ask her question. Okay. And then maybe yeah. we can da- tackle two at once. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, here we go. So uh, there we go. Diana, go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and your wisdom. I'm wondering uh, what kind of practice routines or um, what that structure of your practice looks like. I'm still figuring that out for myself. Hmm. And Shara, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, Let me check what my question was again, because I totally remember. Uh, What advice would you give on working on your range and or like sustaining like higher or lower pitched voices? Uh Aha. One of the answers to both of those questions is I I sing. I don't I wouldn't say I'm a singer, but I do sing. Uh, So if I'm driving up to Los Angeles in any direction. It's about an hour, hour and a half drive, depending on the traffic. So I'll turn on the radio or I'll turn on my Spotify and sing along to songs to get warmed up. Um, Drink lots and lots of water. I cannot stress that enough. Um, Lozenges. I love the Luden's fruit and berry or fruit and honey lozenges. They're so hard to find. But I have those Mm -hmm. around in case you get dry or get crackly. And I believe like you can have Granny Smith apples. That helps too. Um, you know, work out your mouth, stretch it out so you don't have mumbling. So that's that's kind of my warm-up routine. And then a lot of my sessions are early afternoon, late afternoon, so my voice is naturally warmed up by that time of the day. Uh, not so much in the morning, so but I know that about myself, so I try to avoid morning stuff if I can mm-hmm. help it. And mm-hmm. for the range, the, my range, I would say, developed over time. Tress, Tress McNeil is a huge influence. And so a lot of the work she did, like on Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Futurama, her range was so huge, just constantly practicing the characters of your favorite voiceover people. That'll help kind of grow you into that range if you want to have higher and lower pitches. That, that'll work it into it so you know how your diaphragm works, you know how your throat works, so you're not pinching or... or or squeaking up too high. And some of it's a learning process. You'll, you'll know when it doesn't feel right. And then don't do that. You'll find another way to do it. Um, but also range means acting range. So there's plenty mm. of people who do voiceover that have one voice. And my favorite example is Jenny Slate. She's got one voice. You know <laughs> it's her the minute you hear her. Every so often you don't because her acting range is so huge it almost changed her sound. But her work in Bob's Burgers, her work in, oh, what was it, the Minions movie? She was like this 
snooty person in the Minions movie, but it was a completely different character from her snooty character on Bob's Burgers. She did she did, uh, Big Mouth. There's just untold amount of work that she's done, and you hear it in her voice, her acting and her point of view. That's what directs her voice. So even if her voice is the same or doesn't change too much, her acting is what's drawn you in. It's the same with think, Billy Crystal and John Goodman. When I watch Monsters, Inc., I'm not thinking, well, it's just John Goodman and Billy Crystal. No, it's Mike and Sully. They're acting these characters. And yes, I know it's their sound, but it's the characters. And you can tell that from people who are like, okay, this is someone who's just talking, doing the acting they might really need for TV and film with their face as a part of it. But we got to hear it through the voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really is the heart, the heart of animation is that you are bringing that you're bringing that to you're bringing that to life. And what is going on for the character It is first and then the voice comes out of that. I think so many, especially, you know, with the, the dojo being a training center, people are like, oh, I do lots of funny voices it's like cool. But that's all, that's not really the heart of, of animation. So. Really and cool oftentimes, like these funny voices, they, they all stay the same energy level. They stay the same musicality of how they're speaking their lines. Mm -hmm. Or it's so aggressive or so high. Like in, in your mind, I, I can see like you, you want to achieve this acting style, but you're focused so much on the sound. Like, do you know who you're talking to? Do you remember what your goal is in this moment? It, it's, it's a very fine line and you do learn it over time. I've been told... Mm -hmm the same teaching techniques from several teachers, and I think I get it, but I'm not booking. And then one day I do something, and then it hits me, oh, that's what they mean by this. Mm. I felt it. I physically felt it. And now that I know that feeling, I can recreate it or I can use my hook lines to get back into it. And right. it's just one of those things that time will help you build. Yeah, head to heart. Yeah, good. Head to You're heart. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, uh, let's, oh, uh, here's a, a, a sort of tech question from Troy. Uh, oh, thank, thanks, Diana. Thanks for, and, and Shara for your great questions. Um, can we bring Troy up, uh, Duffy? Howdy, howdy. Yep. Oh, hi. Um, Hello. Good eye. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, I feel like this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Dan, about um, the equipment not making you a better actor or necessarily performing better. Um, but with that said, for the sake of longevity of like top notch auditions and knowing that you have like a professional at home recording studio, would you recommend investing in studio bricks? Well, that's a matter of what's your environment like you know if if you have a lot of noise coming in and you need to defend yourself from exterior noise you know sometimes a studio bricks by the way fabulous very expensive i know the guys that that make them uh miguel and guillermo in spain although I, guillermo is in uh in, in new york now but they're it's it's a really nice unit the thing is if your booking work, if your sound of your studio is okay, again, this is one of those things. You, you don't you don't buy great equipment to get work. You work to get great equipment, and it, it's important to think: Is there a problem with my audio that I really need to have that good an environment? And you have to realize that any booth, again, was not designed for voiceover. They were designed primarily for saxophonists and other musicians to be able to practice and not bother people on the outside. So the acoustics in a, a booth, whether it be a studio bricks or, or whisper room or one of the other ones, they have to be adjusted for you. And, mm -hmm. and, that, and there's a, there's a break in period for that. Now, this, the studio bricks is excellent. Uh, they weigh a ton. They're fun to put together. It's like building a Lego thing, but uh, it depends. If you live in a noisy neighborhood, like if somebody is like on the third floor of an apartment in midtown Manhattan, yeah, I might suggest something like a studio bricks. And, and there's a lot of people in New York that use those. Uh, and I know a lot of people here in LA that have them and they're really nice. It's still a matter of 
what is your need? What is you know, where are you right now in your career? And is that going to make a difference? If somebody doesn't say, you know, you got way too much background noise, then it's something to consider. And, you know, that's that's the important thing. I think people tend to way overthink a lot of this stuff and think, well, if I have this booth, it's going to make a big difference. And the people who have booths generally are people who are very well established and have to have that environment. Uh, and they're in a marginal environment. And uh, but if it's quiet, you know, the the most important thing to do is to let somebody who knows what it's supposed to sound like the acronym whistle that I came up with what it's supposed mm -hmm. to sound like, you know, I have a service, you know, for $25 and I, I have my specimen collection cup over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. <laughs> Let me give it a listen. And if it's something that can be solved far less expensively, throwing money at it may not be the best, the best thing to do. If there's a way to deal with something physically uh, that doesn't involve a lot of investment, I would suggest you do that. So let, let me listen to it. You know, there's other guys out there, not many that, actually will listen to your audio and say, it sounds like this. It sounds like that. Here's an issue here. Yes. A studio bricks would help because you're next to an airport. But other than that, um, no, I, I would always recommend a studio bricks if you can afford it. And if you're in that type of an environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. We're going to talk cool. when I move to Burbank, Dan. Okay. <laughs> where, where are you now? Uh, Anaheim. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, so it's just the Fullerton here. Not even that. We don't even Dixon's hear Dixon's the Fullerton. Dixon. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Well, we we're heading into the home stretch here, so let's um, let's see if we can um, answer a bunch of questions. Sure, uh, I can see the questions okay. too, if that kind of helps. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. so um, Ian. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, Ian is asking about. Do impressions become a match for voice match skills? Yes, I think so. Uh, Jim Meskimen is inhuman with his impressions. They sound exactly like the actors he's portraying. And that's that's a skill for voice matching in the way of when we pop in for ADR and looping, we, we, we redo the lines that might have swear words in them if this is going to be aired on TV, if it's going to be aired on airlines. And sometimes like just sounding like it and getting that line out can be enough. If you're taking over for a character, you want to make sure you're acting that character, not just sounding it. Um, TikTok, there are several people who have done impressions on TikTok. I've seen they get millions of views. I've seen them get some work from like companies that might want to showcase them, but it's not so much a job like you're going to be in a commercial, you're going to be in an animated show. I have not seen that happen. And it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes that could be too much. They think, oh, well, yeah, she does all these impressions online, but it could just be impressions. Does she know how to act them? Is it worth bringing them in? But if, they're, if they've got agents and they've got the market offering them those auditions, it can do that. It, it, so it's you're right. Like, when does it get taken seriously and brought into the fold? Yeah. It's taken well, seriously, think... the better you are at it. Like, if you're if you're amazing, that that will speak for itself. One guy did the best Han Solo I ever heard, and I wanted him to audition for the Solo movie because his, mm -hmm. his physicality and his acting and the speaking just in that video was like, this is really good. At least mm -hmm. give him the chance. And I think I think it also becomes then like so much of what you're talking about is how do you how do you sustain how do you create how do you then so you might be able to do the impression and then do you have the heart of it do you have the sustain you just sustain it and then do you understand the business of the animation so that you can serve that you can serve right yeah it's it's a little a little bit different yeah yeah. Cool. If you're going to do it's it's like if you want to do an impression, make sure you do it really well. Or if it's so bad, it's a whole other character entirely. You just got another <laughs> character for your roster. There's a couple of guys I do impressions of and they're nowhere near it. But now it's my character. So my my best Bobcat Goldthwait is well, it's, it is Bobcat Goldthwait, but it's now in a lady voice. So <laughs> and I've auditioned with it a few times just for fun. And sometimes you think like, I don't think I would book this role, but I'm going to have fun in this moment and just do what makes me laugh. Yeah. And it could come back in the future for another character entirely. You never know. Which is a great segue to Thomas's or Tomas, I'm not sure how to say it, but um, question. And um, guys, just for so, so we can get the answers, we'll, we'll 
um, we'll, we'll pop over to answering, mm -hmm. but um, Thomas is there a asked, character? Uh, yeah, is there a character you, you vo or voice you wish you could do or uh, wish you or did wish you had originated? Uh, I would love to perform Witch Hazel for Looney Tunes in the future. It's it's she's voiced right now by Candy Milo, and but Looney Tunes can change often, or you never know what the future will hold. So I'd love to do that later in life. I very much would have loved to have done Baby Piggy for Muppet Babies, but Baby Piggy is actually very close to Minnie, so I can see why, like, you know what, that might not have been the best fit if she's sounding too much like a completely different established character. So, but Miss Piggy's my favorite in general. So, but, you know, it, as long as you're doing your very best at the audition and the love you have for that character is coming through, you were that character for that brief minute. So, and some characters I wish I did... If I, if I had done them, they wouldn't be the character I love because the character I love came from this other person. It's, it's like a catch-22. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, I'd love to voice a character that reaches people the way the Warners did in Animaniacs or the way the Futurama characters did. Mm -hmm. Like having that type of evoked emotion is what I strive to achieve. Yeah. It's almost the, it's almost the next dream, right? So one one dream is to be an iconic character that has existed, and then the next dream is to create the next iconic character. Yeah, yeah right? and there's that's, new that's ideas kind of... every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason Lachey, uh, my Rode microphone I use for uh, actual sessions, so I would say yes. I don't know anything about the MK416. That is for Dan. <laughs> There it is. There's my MK416. <laughs> You're hearing me. Great microphone for, uh, you know, for marginal places. But if you go into any studio in Hollywood or in a lot of other places, that's what they're using. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a great, you know, uh, very versatile microphone designed for movie sets and video production more than anything else. If you see the guy with the Hollywood pole, you know, you know, following an actor on stage or on on screen uh on set uh it that's what they use and because it works well from a distance and it works really great close up too so it's it's one of the great things about it so it's it's a good mic to have it's also a thousand bucks but i've mm -hmm. had this for about 10 years and it that's that's all i use primarily <laughs> yeah. uh, and janet which, um oh yeah um uh, tell I us wanted, what an inter wanted, oh yeah go ahead sorry Trish. before we get into uh because this is a little bit of a whole nother subject i wanted to um i wanted to make a note too about something else that you said caitlin about your internal journey right that you said i'm really i'm hard on myself um i'm i i you know strive i so I just wanted to know like make note that at the highest levels we all still need to to um be figuring out that internal internal landscape and who we're tussling with and how we get how we get to what we get to but make it easy so um i just wanted to i just wanted to point that out because you know in, in the dojo that's something that is like the heart the, the heart of our training here so how how it works uh you know that that it's something that we all are always uh dealing with and so we've got this technical part like the the mic part, we've got the heart part, and we've got like our our psyche part, like the soul part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even um, the greats make mistakes. I I did a session, and Kevin Michael Richardson flubbed his line like six times, and it was and this is Kevin Michael Richardson, and I watched him, and I was like, he's a human, he's like me, <laughs> like he's he's not perfect out the gate that I assumed, but you know because his work is so phenomenal, but. The final product, who knows how many takes it took to get there. He stepped outside, got water, came back, and nailed it on the first take. So give yourself grace. Give yourself leniency. I've had rough days and like, oh, I, I feel like, okay, you did what you were supposed to. Did you go over your quota? I don't know, but I'm going to treat myself to P.F. Chang's. I deserved it. <laughs> yeah well let's let's take these last questions uh real quick so uh janet asks what's an interview with a vo agent like and then um diana uh piggybacks yeah. with difference between regional and and uh other uh regional and i guess major market would be um expectations and the relationship this so one well it's a little tricky because my interview with avo was 
in January of 2013. So I don't I, remember too much. And I was coming in as a recommendation. I remember telling them, you know, I love animation the most. It's what I want to do. <clears throat> I have, I want to be mini in the future, the far, far future. I'm not gunning for the role. I'm not trying to usurp or be this, this great person. I just kind of like, it's a dream I have. I want to work for. These are the voice actors I really aspire to be like. I live down here, but I'm willing to drive up to the agency every day and work around my work schedule at Disneyland. So it's it was being. I remember telling them, "This is who I am. This is what I want." And at that point, do you fit in their roster? Do they have a voice like you? Do they have a character type like you? And mm-hmm. sometimes it's just that all the stars have to align. So I'm submitted for the same character archetypes as Gray Griffin or Cat Sousy. Or, or Candy Milo, and but we all of our versions of this archetype are completely different. So no mm. one is stepping on anyone else's toes. They're all completely different. And they're all valid. It just depends who they go with. The yeah. regional agents that I have, I'm still not sure I did it right. Um, I would email the appropriate submission email, and I, I'd put my resume and my demos, and I'd said I'm interested in being a part of your team uh, mm-hmm. whenever you have an opening on your roster. And I've been told, like, putting in the subject line seeking representation is a no-no so but mm. i haven't i haven't pursued many regional agents in some time because i've been very lucky to be so busy here with my mm. home agent but i'm definitely down to learning more about that myself okay. well and it's and and at a also good to know like everybody's everybody's got some place that we can all fill in um at, at the dojo we talk about um you're thinking of of um any agent relationship, um, as as Caitlin said, who are you choosing to bring on to your team to get you where you want to go? So the first thing of what is an interview like, um, you can switch that around um, by what do you make an interview with an agent like, right? I think so much of what, as, as actors and performers, there's so much language and so much psychology that's about um, submitting, submitting to an agent and they will represent you because you need to be represented, which is, you know, true in some ways. And if you don't make it dramatic, yes. But you can also say empowering things, right? I deliver, I deliver my audition because I did the work and here it is. I'm not submitting for your review, right? Um, I um, have a, a team who, um, who works for me, right? So yes. I think first of all, there's a mindset of that and going into an interview with, with an agent of what I heard you say, Caitlin, is I knew exactly what I wanted. Um, I knew exactly who I was. And so presenting that, and so make it an interview of the agency yes. and see if it's a good fit there. Your um, agent, yeah. your agent should be working for you just like you're working for your agent. And I mean this in two ways. If there's some, um, when I started at, at AVO, they only had me do commercials. I was still working on animation in their eyes to be competable. So any natural talent I thought I had or how like, oh, I can sound like this, that, and the other thing. Take mo- I just took more and more classes and workshops. When I would take those classes and workshops, if I did a role or a character that got a really positive response from my, from my director of that class, be it a vocal director or a casting director, they would send us copies of our work. I would cut out a portion of that showing like a brief line or two of what I did and the director's response. I would send that little MP3 clip to my agents and say, I took this class with Sally Salerson at at Warner Brothers and I did this character archetype, she loved it. May I please start reading for these character archetypes? So I I keep in constant contact with my agents at least once a week. Uh, Same with little old ladies. A couple roles had come by that I didn't read for. I said, I'd love to start reading for these. Here's an example I just did in a class with this casting director. And I've got two others in the tank that I just goof around with. And then Mm -hmm. they're like, thank you for letting us know. We'll start that. And the very next one I got, I booked. So it was like... and what I hear you saying, Caitlin, is you're driving the car and you're, we, we um, this came up in, a, in an nth degree workout. We have a working pro weekly workout and um, focus action forum twice a month, our working pro um, 
a, a part of our working pro division here. And um, Dylan Saunders, who was at CESD, said something so brilliant. He said, how am I constantly bringing something of bringing value to my relation to our working relationship? So what Caitlin just said was, A, she's out meeting people. And so she, and then she is precise about like, this is the experience. This is it. I bring value because now I'm connected to this person. This person will now call you. Uh, my agent team to get this. So we'll have, we'll all have a relationship mm -hmm. and I'm out working on myself. I'm, I'm working towards what I want. So it's, how can you bring value? Um, and I did have, um, I, had one, it, I had one last addendum on that. I'll be my, I'll make it real quick. I promise. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In this, I've seen a lot of my peers, they sign on to an agency and then within a few months they've left the agency and they're like, they weren't submitting me on any of these things. And I, and a part of me is like, not you. to be that person, <laughs> but it could be you. You may think you're really good at these characters, but you might not be. And I'm not saying that to be mean. It's that you got to stick it out. And if you're feeling like, why am I not reading for these things? Talk to the agent. You And it's not about them. Make it about you. When I was not reading for certain things, I did not ask my agents, how come I'm not reading for these? That's putting blame on them when they've got so many other people and a very working knowledge of what's today's trends. I would say I'd love to read for these and I haven't been. What can I do to, to better improve that performance for you, for you to then be able and submit me to the casting for, directors? For to, us. For, for us. us. You don't yeah. make your 10% unless I book. How can I book if I'm not reading for roles? Let's, let's figure out what I can do and I'll do it. And I just yeah. kept workshops and classes and I, I went over and above to show them this is what I want. Please help me out. And that that's mm -hmm. how it should be. That's why I've stayed with AVO for mm -hmm. what now? Uh, nine years. Yeah. yeah. I've been with them for nine years. I never left because we're working together the, yeah. and I can tell and them these things. It, and people exactly. who leave after. Yeah. People who leave after a few months, like, I don't think it's them. I think it's you. You got to keep working harder to stand out. Well, assume also, it's you always assume it's you and keep working hard yeah but it, and then also to keep on going that we are a team on this it's not mm -hmm. i'm doing something for you we're doing something together we're doing something together because that that also just keeps you driving the car right yeah, so, yeah. and if you well, try and they don't respond at that point then like okay you might have a better fit elsewhere but right. if, give it at least a, a few tries have, yeah, if you have a bad boyfriend that doesn't actually listen to you, then get another boyfriend, right? Yeah, but, but there's there's a difference between never listening and like, oh, I didn't understand at first, or it was a miscommunication. Right. And getting it's, a, it's all part of the process. Yeah, um, and starts with you. So that's the key. Okay, it's a little bit over a la, uh, uh, the hour. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, we'll let you know how we can keep, you can keep in touch with everyone, talk a little bit about what the, what's going on at the dojo. And um, if you can stay on a little bit after each of these, we do um, open up breakout rooms that you can stay and chat with each other about what, what you, we just explored. Um, uh, Caitlin, I think you can hang out for a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Dan, I don't know if you can, but if you can, I, I can, I'll, I have to step away for a few minutes, but I'll come yeah, back. Okay. I I All right, cool, cool, cool. So Jeffrey, if, if you want to, if you want to hang out and do a breakout room, Jeffrey will put you in them. I, I myself have a session, so I'll, I'll wrap up here and then have to roll. Um, but uh, let's see. So Dan, how do, how do people keep in touch with you? And um, very easy. Just go over to homevoiceoverstudio.com, which I think is in the chat there. And if you want to have a, a analysis of your home studio audio or your personal professional studio audio, we're going <laughs> to out of our heads. Uh, scroll down to the bottom of my homepage. You'll find my specimen collection cup. And uh, that, <laughs> that is a drop box for, uh, for, your, for your audio. And, uh, you know, and I want it raw. I don't want all your processing, all the stuff that you've been learning on <laughs> Facebook in there. I want to hear what your, your room sounds like with you. So follow the okay. instructions there. And Dan can also do a consultation if you just want to come and just like, let's, let's get this all together. Um, he can do that. And then uh, VOBS, what's up with that? Oh, uh, well, we do it live Monday nights, but it's on Facebook and on our, our website, VOBS.tv. Uh, you know, well over 300 episodes of more voiceover mm -hmm. information than you can possibly stuff in your brain. I can't huge, believe I've been doing it for 10 years, but yeah. <laughs> 
Great. And Caitlin, um, I know you are talent and maybe, you know, not have time, but um, is there a way that you would like people, like, can people sign up on your Instagram or how would oh, you? Oh, yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah. I'm not on social media a huge amount, but I definitely check in. I try to check in once a day, but Twitter is at Caitlin Robrock. I believe Instagram is K Robrock. Mm -hmm. I, I accidentally made a second one that was Caitlin Robrock, and I put specifically, not this one, go to the other account. <laughs> um, and then Caitlin Robrock voiceover on Facebook. So they all have messaging systems. So I try to, like, remember, okay, check your messages, check the ones that aren't from mutuals, like, that are in the other folder. So I yeah. definitely try to get back to as many people. And sometimes you get interesting messages, so I try to vet them. So please say, like, oh, I saw your VO Dojo class, so I know, yeah, okay, exactly. I'm going to talk to you right away. You're not someone who's i can Rando. see inside of your apartment <laughs> yeah. we're not, not going to answer that one <laughs> that's awesome and at the dojo um we are just ramping up this is the beginning of our fall session um so wherever you are on your journey we can meet you where you are and take you where you want to go um if you're just starting out um our you should do voiceover intensive is a great way to get a uh, comprehensive overview and a little taste of everything um everywhere where your voice can be making money um september is sold out but we have classes in october um if you are interested in uh the working pro division which uh you know most of us here are at that like working pro or about to be working pro our nth degree program um uh weekly workouts twice monthly focus action forms and we also have um an nth degree intensive, which is just focused on the business of uh, voiceover and um, taking one weekend to lay a blueprint for the next however many months you, you want. Um, uh, so that's coming up. We have a few spots left. So if you're interested in that, um, touch base with uh, info at the VO Dojo. Um, we also have our fight clubs coming up. Fight club season is ramping up. This is our working pro workout that brings together top-notch talent with the decision makers who hire us. We have a fabulous lineup for the fall, um, starting with Mami Okada, who's one of the top uh, anime directors in town, mm -hmm. Bang Zoom. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she's coming up soon. Um, Tina Morasco from Sound and Fury. If you get commercial auditions today, um, <laughs> you need to know all <laughs> yes. the amazing women at uh, Sound and Fury. And then uh, Ned Lott, one of our favorite, favorite, favoritest um, uh, Fight Club directors, um, animation director extraordinaire, Disney Pixar legacy building, and one of the nicest people yes. in North America, and in both hemispheres, I think. He's, he's really one of the most loveliest persons in the world. Um, I've taken several classes with Ned, several. Mm -hmm. he, he was essential for me mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Like yeah. I can't, I cannot stress how amazing it was. It worth every yeah. penny. Yeah, and if and if you are if you are inspired by Caitlin's path and have Disney in your in your dreams, um, definitely. Um, you, uh, players uh, demo repped and booking, um, but everyone can audit those. So check everything out. Um, www.theviodojo.com. And if you are interested in talking and finding out more, you can sign up for what we call a voiceover once over 15 minute uh, chat where we'll talk to you about where you're at and where you'd like to be. Um, yeah, we do this every Wednesday, um, every Wednesday, uh, uh, not every Wednesday, the first Wednesday of every month, um, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. PT. Um, I'm going to roll and get ready for my session. Jeffrey is going to be here. Um, Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Dan, always, Dan will be back in a second. But um, if you have to roll, um, we shall be sending out a replay if you want to, like, you know, get best of. Um, and then uh, next month, uh, Byron Wagner is coming. He's an amazing VO vet who um, is a... Uh, we call it a VO entrepreneur, um, and he's he's got a new uh, resource that he's uh, created for the voiceover community called Abiton. So he'll be uh, sharing about how he approaches his voiceover. That's next month, October, and um, I think that's everything. Um, uh, Jeffrey's put everything. Have, is everything in the chat? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, yeah. Great to have you here. 
Um, super excited to start the fall session and we will see you all soon. I'm going to sign out and Jeffrey, take it away. Thanks, Caitlin. So Thank appreciate you, it. <laughs> take care. Bye everyone.